welcome Arnie Gunderson, who is with Fairwind Associates, lives up in the Burlington area, and is kind enough to join us uh, on a somewhat regular basis to talk about nuclear issues. Arnie is a uh, nuclear engineer and really has been the go-to guy worldwide on the whole Fukushima disaster in Japan, where you'll recall there are a number of uh, nuclear facilities there greatly affected is an understatement by the earthquake and then the tsunami uh, that followed it. Arnie, thank you for joining us. How are you this morning? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm fine. I know you've actually been over there in that part of the world visiting. Maybe we can kind of cut to the chase here because one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on is that this story seems to basically dropped out of the news, but it is 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 it as bad, worse, or better than it was when the disaster happened? You know, it's it's like a, a one of those Chucky movies where you think you kill it and it keeps popping its head up. But um, you know, the the, um, the the decay products take um, years to completely cool down. But you know, we're now we're two hundred days into the I'm sorry, a, a year and, and a month into the accident. So most of the heat has decayed away. There's still you know thousands and thousands of horsepower, but. In comparison to right before the accident, the, the heat is uh, is decayed away. You'll still see them steaming, uh, but nowhere near as much as uh, as they were during the accident. So, so that part's the good news. But what's got the uh, world in an uproar right now is the um, the spent fuel pool at Unit Four um, has an enormous amount of fuel in it, including um, the um, the guts from the reactor. Uh, so there's no fuel in the nuclear reactor. It's all out in the pool. And this Mark I design has no um, roof over it. You know, it's, it's been uh, exploded away. And the fear is that uh, if there's an earthquake, um, which I guess they get those in Japan. I've heard that. If there's an earthquake, the, um, the pool may crack and um, drain, at which point the fuel is still hot enough uh, to burn. And, uh, you know, there's still a possibility of having to evacuate Tokyo as a result. So if there's no earthquake, I mean, you know, pray for something. Pray for no earthquake um, and, and pray that they rapidly uh, defuel that fuel pool. Is it what you call the situation today stabilized in any way? Um, you know, I, I, uh, th- there's a common In engineering, there's, there's uh, static equilibrium. And if you put a ball bearing on a, in the bottom of a cup, and roll it. It always rolls back to the center. That's that's stable in my mind. If you put a ball bearing exactly on the top of a cup, it'll balance there until something comes and it'll roll off, and that's called dynamic. Uh, and so I think it's more dynamic. You know, if there's no earthquakes, um, uh, it will uh, you know gradually cool down and, and gradually get under control. The big question is, you know, is there another big one lurking? Uh huh. Is um, are the radiation levels in that that cl- that the close proximity to the plant have they dissipated? Well, the radiation levels in the plant are uh, are astronomical. I mean, I've never seen anything like it in my professional career. Uh, in Unit Two, um, that's the one that looks like it's intact, but in fact, it, it melted down as well. They were able to get a probe inside uh, into the containment. And the radiation levels were um, were 7,000 R an hour. Uh, 1,000 R an hour kills you. So it, uh, it, it's you know, seven times lethal concentrations. And it's so radioactive that it actually interferes with the circuits on robots. So no one really knows how uh, you know the cleanup is going to proceed because the radiation levels are so high that a person can't do it. And they're also so high that a robot can't do it. So... It's going to be a, a long slog before they uh, they decontaminate those units. Is that would you describe that as the biggest problem, quote unquote, there today? Um, it, it's the biggest problem is money. Uh, they really need about a half a trillion dollars to clean up the units and dismantle them, and also clean up uh, um, an area the size of Connecticut. They need to uh, take about two inches of soil throughout the entire prefecture. Um, that's a state, and the state is roughly the size of Connecticut. So um, that's a lot of real estate, and, and, uh, and the numbers I'm seeing are somewhere between 400 and $600 billion that are going to have to come out of uh, the Japanese, you know, through taxes and rate increases to, um, to clean it up. And Tokyo Electric's not moving fast enough because they're cash-strapped. Um, you know, like I was, we were talking about Unit 4, 
and Unit 4 has a, um, is, is precarious. And a year ago I was saying on, on radio that the solution is to build a building around the building. Well, just last week they came up with that solution. So they basically lost a year. And, uh, um, and I, I, I firmly am convinced that there's a lot of things they could be doing, but they simply can't afford it. And, uh, and that's, that, that's a sad situation to be in in an emergency like this. If you had to prioritize what you would do there, what would it be? Unifor fuel pool. Um, it's a top priority because the fuel is sitting out in the air. Now, this is identical to Vermont Yankee. You know, the, they have the, the fuel pool. It's the same design, except the roof happens to be on it. But um, uh, actually, Vermont Yankee's got 37 years of nuclear fuel in it, and this one only has seven. So, um, uh, you know, these, these fuel pools up high in general are a concern. They're solvable. They're solvable across the world. Um, dry cast storage solves it. The, Fukushima had fuel in dry casks. And uh, they survived the tsunami and the earthquake just fine. So the solution is to get it out of the fuel pools and onto the ground uh, just as quickly as possible. All right, this may be a dumb question. Are any of the, none of these units are operational? Uh, right. They have. Uh, there's about ten of them um, that are, are likely. Well, there's six of them that are definitely shut down forever, and uh, and likely another four. Um, there's Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, which is the um, the one we always when we call Fukushima, it, it's really Fukushima Daiichi. Um, Fukushima is the prefecture, and Fukushima Daiichi is the uh, is the unit. Prefecture is like a state. Like instead of calling it Vermont, we call it Vermont Yankee. Um, but then there's one only six miles away that was almost as damaged, Fukushima uh, Daini, um, and it's down too. So they may have lost uh, uh, ten of their fifty reactors to the tsunami for permanently. Why can't they take or can they take the fuel rods out of this exposed fuel pool and put them into dry cast storage, or is it just too hot to do that? The um, the the heavy crane that's above the fuel pool was destroyed in the explosions, as was the little bit smaller crane that actually moves the fuel. Both those cranes were destroyed in the explosions. So um, and structurally, then they have to remove the cranes and they have to build new rails for the trains the cranes to move on. Um, it's um, it's radioactive work. You know, these guys are wearing the respirators and the big white suits and all that kind of stuff. But it's work that has to be done. Huh. So it's doable, but it's and it's just the enormity of the job is what's really keeping it from happening. Yes. And the, the next fuel pool up, Unit 3, is, um, is similar. It's got um, about half the fuel in it that Unit 4 does. So as soon as they get Unit 4 done, they need to move on to Unit 3 and do it over again. Um, you know, both of those structures were severely damaged by the explosions and the tsunami and the earthquake. So um, they're weakened, and you know, the fear is that uh, you know, another earthquake could, uh, could break them even further. Okay, I know you're not a, an earthquake specialist here, but what, what kind of scale of an earthquake would, would be a problem here? Uh, anything exceeding a 7 and um, of course, the earthquake that was a, that that hit out in the Pacific was a nine. But by the time it got to the site, it was about a seven point nine. So anything exceeding a seven uh, would would worry me. And I tell my friends in Japan, you know, if you if you feel the big one, um, you know, check the radio and check the TV feeds to make sure that those units are still intact. Um, there, there is serious talk in Japan about you know what would we have to do if we had to evacuate Tokyo. 40 million people that are 150 miles away, it would be, uh, you know, extraordinary. It, would, it would destroy the country. I mean, basically, the fabric of the country would no longer be. And how do you, I mean, how would you ever evacuate 40 million people? Um, that's a great question, and <laughs> I don't have an answer. How close, how, tell me where you visited. Um, I spent most of the time in Tokyo itself. Um, I went to one of the nuclear plants there um, called Hamoaka, um, and uh, they are very serious about um, taking the lessons learned from Fukushima, and, uh, um, and, and they're not going to start that plant up until they've, they've learned the lessons. They're, they're building a tsunami wall that's 70 feet high and, and 6 feet across and 2 miles long. Um, and but they're also protecting the 
pumps, the water pumps along the uh, along the river, um, along the ocean rather. And what they've learned is that um, uh, they're they're talking about staging extra equipment on the hill and with bulldozers so that if there's another tsunami, they can push all the debris out of the way and bring down the extra equipment immediately. You know, there's a, a comment came out um, from the plant manager at Fukushima Daini, which is the one that's um, about six miles away from the accident. And he said, if we're lucky, it was because this accident happened on a Friday. If it had happened on a Saturday, there wouldn't, there, instead of a thousand people there, there would have been a couple hundred and they wouldn't have had enough people to, um, to respond. So, um, you know, there are these little moments of luck in life in the middle of something that's catastrophic. Did I understand you right? You said earlier that 10 out of the 50 nuclear power plants in the country are basically shut down? Well, all of them, except for one, are shut down. Um, they, they, you know, the last one will shut down in about four days. They have 54. And um, the, the Japanese have a system where the state, the, the prefecture, has the right to uh, um, allow the plant to start back up. And there's enough public pressure and enough scientific fear that they're, when these units shut down to be refueled, the, um, the public is refusing to allow them to start back up, sort of like Vermont Yankee in reverse. And, and um, so they, of the 54, uh, 10 are likely, um, between 10 and 15, are likely never going to start up. Um, two or three have been discovered to be sitting right on earthquake cracks. And um, so in the review post-Fukushima, they are, um, uh, they're taking a, a hard look at whether or not uh, um, some of these should be uh, decommissioned immediately. Okay, you say 10 to 15 are likely to be shut down, and, and there are how many shut down today? Uh, 54 are, uh, 53 are shut down of the 54. Um, you know, the concern is that when they start bringing these things back online, it's likely that between 10 or 15 may never go back online. So out of the 54, um, you know, perhaps 40 may go back online uh, eventually. Okay, I'm sorry to harp on this. 53 out of the 54 nuclear power plants in Japan are offline right now? Yes. How are they getting their power? Um, you know, but they, they have a lot of ways of creating power. There's a lot of excess in the, uh, in the system. Um, they are conserving, um, and they fired up some old units that had been mothballed. Not some old nuclear units, but some old fossil units. So they have... Um, uh, they've done a really good job at conserving and then in addition they've uh, you know fired up some gas fire generation that uh, um, that had been uh, sitting idle wow i mean I'm, I'm, that's that blows me away that's just remarkable that they've been able to continue as a country with 53 out of 54 nuclear power plants not on yeah it's 35 percent of their power so they've decided we can do without 35 percent of our power you know, we, there's a, actually a precedent here in the United States that the city of Juneau, Alaska, had three power lines coming into it. And um, a couple years ago, a landslide took out one power line. So essentially they lost 33% of their power. And life went on. They, they figured out ways to conserve and um, you know, drop their electric use, and they got by on two out of the three. So it is possible in extraordinary situations for people to do extraordinary things. We're talking with Arnie Gunderson of Fairwind Associates. He's been following the Fukushima disaster. Let's go to Montpelier. Dave, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Arnie. It's great to hear this program. It's really timely. And i got to say, the science and engineering cultures here are demonstrating what a mature culture looks like in action. What is not mature seems to me to be the political culture and the economic culture. So, Arnie, what, in your broad experience, the mature political cultural response to Fukushima on a global and national scale look like? Would it? it I mean, let's tie the, the BP Gulf disaster into this as well. Or on a local scale, Irene, what does a mature political culture? How do they react to something like this? Well, that's a great question. You know, if you look for examples, it, it's gone. You know, the extreme is, of course, Germany is going to phase out all their nuclear plants in the next ten years, and there's certainly a mature political culture. And, and then there's, uh, you know, the United States that um, 
um, is actually you know building uh, four more plants in the south um, the southeast um, even uh, despite Fukushima. You know, I think that mat- the mature culture is uh, is what Chairman Yasko of the NRC is suggesting, um, and he's been outvoted um, on, on the commission. But his position is, um, if, if we're going to consider new nuclear power, uh, let's hold up on uh, on licensing these new nukes until we've figured out all of the fallout from Fukushima, all of the mechanical problems that have to be fixed, and that's probably you know three years into the into the future. And he said um, similar things for license renewals as well. He's, uh, he suggested that, you know, rather than renew these licenses, let's just put them, not, don't shut the plant down, but don't give them a 20-year buy. Let's, let's hold those licenses until we can uh, make sure that all the Fukushima mods are, are, are fit in. I think, um, you know, he's the, um, he's the adult in, in, in that organization. But the other commissioners have... Uh, um, which are much more pro-industry, have outvoted him uh, uh, four to one. Let me take a moment of your time to remind you about our friends at Jet Service Envelope for outstanding uh, uh, local printing needs. We encourage you to call the folks at the Jet. You can reach them at 229-9335. Envelopes, letterhead, brochures, and much more. Any printing that you need to get done, posters, anything like that, make it all happen at Jet Service Envelope. Of course, they do have envelopes as well. You can reach them at 229-9335, and you'll find them on the web at jetservice-envelope.com. Let's uh, head over to Barry. Mike, good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't know if I missed this, and I apologize, but uh, I wondered if your guest could kind of give everybody a, a little bit of a feel or, uh, you know, how, about what life is like for people um, you know, like kids and everybody, you know, how and for what distances away, how it's affected people's lives and for what distances. Okay, good question. Thanks. Yeah, Mike, Mike that's a great question. Um, you know, the Japanese culture is one where um, uh, uh, there's a, um, an obedience to authority that would amaze an American. So when this accident happened, they, they all sort of uh, did what the government said. Despite the fact there were people like me saying, you know, you should evacuate sooner and you should evacuate further out, especially women and children. But over the last year, um, that culture is breaking down. And especially with um, women and children, uh, um, there's, a, there's a split, a political split, as well as marital splits occurring between um, husbands and wives. There's women in Fukushima that are taking their kids and leaving. They actually call the term a Fukushima divorce. Um, whereas the men will say, well, the government says it's okay and I'm going to stay. Um, the, the, the women are, um, are, are picking up and, and leaving without their husbands. And in a culture that's you know, very um, uh, lockstep, it's extraordinary to see that happen. Uh, it's also having um, uh, political ramifications on the national level. There, there was a, um, a hearing just recently, and, and an American journalist was covering it, and he was sitting next to a Japanese journalist, and the people were screaming at the uh, presenters. And the Japanese journalist turned to the American and said, I can't believe this is Japan. He had never seen that happen before. So there's certainly a breakdown in um, the, the willingness to trust authority in Japan as a result of this. And that may have long-term political ramifications. Uh, you know, they've already um, lost one prime minister and the, the new prime minister is on shaky ground as a result too so um, it's very unstable and i maybe i missed this but we were talking earlier about this evacuation area are people allowed now back in or not they're bringing them back in into zones that uh, can be as high as two rem per year um, and what that means is that the average nuclear worker gets half a rem and um, almost every nuclear worker never gets more than two REM. So they're bringing people back in, um, large numbers of people back into areas where um, you know, nuclear workers are essentially um, exposed on a routine basis. Uh, the difference is that nuclear workers get paid and, and you know, there's, there's a, a risk-reward, whereas the people moving back in are, um, are not. But the co- other concern, though, if you look at that number, two REM, um, about one in 500 people per year will get a cancer at that level. 
uh, per the, the Bureau report, um, biological effects of ionizing radiation. But for kids and for women, it's about 10 times worse, about one in, in, in 50 per year. So if you stay there five years, it's one out of every 10 kids or women would, would develop a cancer in their lifetime. So, you know, because they blend it out over a large population, old guys like me are going to die of something else before the cancer ever hits. But the, uh, but the young and the women are particularly radiosensitive. And that's what's driving this political system we see there, that um, the, um, uh, you know, the women and the kids are more concerned than are the, the men and the elder people. Um, did I answer that, Mark? Yeah. Okay. Let's head to Greensboro next. David, good morning. Good morning. I've been to Japan nine times, Tokyo area principally. I wonder if the Tokyo residents know of the level of radiation they're living in, um, given your sample test results. Um, I don't know if you've sent your test results to any media in Japan in an effective way to the newspapers or perhaps to NHK television. Um, so I'd like to hear about that. I'd like to know that the people understand what the, um, the crisis is ongoing and that they really need to focus on cleaning up the fuel situation at Daiichi. Uh, once again, International Monetary Fund, there should be a, a, an international monetary effort to assist the Japanese in cleaning up these plants which could melt down further given the dropping level of coolant at uh, reactor number two, for instance. And that radioactive cloud would affect us all. Yeah, I had the same thought, too, when Arnie was talking about that half a trillion, that, you know, perhaps we might per be in all of this together. Hello? You know, there's actually a petition on the White House blog, if you go... Um, we're, uh, go up on, uh, over to the White House blog, um, and look for Fukushima. There is a petition asking the United States to become more active, uh, uh, both financially and, and, and technically. Uh, and I think that's an important first step is having a lot of citizens realize that we are all in this together. Um, what the, what the listener was saying is that when I was in Japan, I, um, I took, um, samples. I had, uh, little sample bags. I took five samples from, Routine places, a crack in the pavement, kids' playground, some moss on the side of the road, the roof, and um, the, the, the place I was at had a garden on the roof, and I took some uh, samples from there, and then right across from the Supreme Court, and I brought them back, declared them through customs, and sent them to a lab, and the, uh, the concentration of, of radioactivity in those samples was high enough that had it been in the United States, it would be nuclear waste. So, um, yet people are... Um, unaware that you know there are cracks in their pavement and their sidewalks are, are contaminated. Um, the book I wrote in Japanese is um, has been number one on the science section of um, uh, of the Japanese bestsellers. I mean, it's, it's not even in the top hundred nationwide, but w within people who read science material, it's been number one for two months now. And I think that, uh, that, you know, that's an indication that, that serious people are serious within Japan. But, again, you run into those cultural issues where, you know, the, the, it's very comforting to do what the government says and, and, not, um, and not really think for yourself. Okay. Uh, David was asking, too, whether or not you have, do you feel that you've, aff I mean, this book sounds like where, where he was going, but do you feel that you've been effective in getting the information out to the Japanese media? Um, Actually, I have a, a, a long interview with, uh, uh, with Tokyo Broadcasting on Friday. So they clearly are interested. When, when I was there, I had uh, 10 interviews over five days uh, with, the, with the media. Um, there is an interest in hearing from people other than Tokyo Electric and other than from the, their own government. There's a, a, a real lack of trust. And uh, we have been told, Maggie and I have been told, that the Fairwind's website fills that within Japan, and uh, it seems to be the, uh, the go-to site for people who want to um, find out about what's going on in their own country. We have translators that translate everything over to Japanese. And the government has been open to letting that kind of thing happen? We have not been censored. You know, Japan is certainly different than China. Uh, but the, uh, 
You know, the 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 new uh, uh, premier of Japan, when um, when the accident happened, he was the economic minister. And he, uh, there's emails from him three weeks after the accident saying, whatever happens, we cannot let this accident affect Tokyo Electric. So within the government, their emphasis has been on, um, you know, first Tokyo Electric, second protecting the government. And if there's any extra goodwill left, they'll protect their people. But it's, uh, the pyramid should, it, it, it is reversed from the way it should be. Well, I would have loved to have been a fly in your luggage when you got the customs and they asked you if you had anything to declare. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely wasn't going to sneak it through, but they were very, uh, they were great about it. You know, I had to go into a separate room and, and uh, they, they brought out their testing equipment, et cetera. But uh, no, it was, uh, I felt it was uh, very professionally handled. They, so they actually let you bring back in radioactive material. Yes, I explained what it was, and I explained what I was doing with it. It was triply bagged in, in, you know, in a bag, inside a bag, inside a bag. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the quantity was uh, on, on the several-ounce level. I wasn't bringing back truckloads. Uh, but when you, um, when you measure what's in that material, it turns out to be 7,000 clicks, 7,000 disintegrations every second. In, uh, if, if it had been two pounds... It would be seven thousand clicks of a Geiger counter every second in that in that pile of dirt. But, I mean, considering you know the the scrupulousness that Customs has, and if you bring back uh, plant seeds or something from a, another country, or a, a cutting from a from a tree from another country, they would take that away from you. <laughs> they were they wanted to know if I had been on a farm. They were terrified of mad cow. And I said, no, this came from downtown Tokyo, and that seemed to be uh, their bigger concern was mad cow compared to, uh, to radiation. So wow. I'm glad I got the samples in, and, and uh, you know, we have a, a competent lab analysis now that, that shows it. Um, one, one, uh, one sample also picked up uranium, um, which was uh, unique, and that needs more study. And the others uh, contain cesium-134 or 137. Which that's the signature of Fukushima. This isn't bomb waste. This isn't just cesium-137. When you see the two together, you know it came from Fukushima. So, bottom line here, Arnie, is your biggest worry is another earthquake. You got it. Okay. Hey, thanks for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Send our best to your better half. Okay. Bye, bye. Arnie Gunderson uh, is with Fairwind Associates, and they operate out of Burlington. It's you heard him mention. I mean, he, he's. Uh, you know, this is not somebody whose uh, the interest in what he's doing is confined to the state of Vermont. I mean, worldwide, he's uh, getting interest on this subject. Amazing. Wow. I, I'm just still kind of stunned on a couple of different levels here. That whole idea that 53 out of the 54 nuclear power plants shut down and through conservation and firing up other, uh, I guess, coal burning and other fossil fuel plants that they're able to somehow keep the lights on. Wow, that's remarkable just in and of itself.